Thank you very much for taking time to come and speak to us today. It's my pleasure. Right, so here we're here spe sitting at this kind of auspicious desk, really, with the portrait of George Williams behind us. And really just want to talk about, firstly, what is your role in the YMCA? Well, currently I, w I work as Head of International Affairs with the National Council of YMCA's in England and Wales. And what was your first involvement with the YMCA? Ah, my first involvement? Um, well, as I'm sure you can tell from my accent, I, uh, I'm not from England and Wales. I grew up in Ireland, in Northern Ireland. And uh, my first involvement when it was when I was 11 years of age. And uh, I went down to my local YMCA and uh, the door was closed. And I knocked on the door and somebody came to the door and says, what, would you, what do you want? And I says, I'd like to come in, please. And they said, you can't come in here until you're 14. Really? So did you try and fight that? Try and get in early? Well, when I was walking back down the steps, I thought to myself, I'm going to get in there and I'm going to change that rule. And by the time I was 23, I was the General Secretary. Fantastic. So you had quite a, a quick kind of progression, really, through the YMCA. Well, I, I guess I started in the youth club and then took on voluntary roles and positions and then moved into a part-time paid position. And at that time, I was uh, pursuing a, an apprenticeship in turning machining okay. and building steam turbines for power stations. And uh, I didn't like that much. And I felt that uh, there was another role in life for me. And I guess I fell in love with YMCA. That must have been a very brave thing to have done at that time, to have kind of said no to an apprenticeship. It was, you know, no, I'm going to spend all my time with the YMCA instead. Well, I had completed my apprenticeship, so my apprenticeship was four years long. I had completed that, and I worked as what you might call a tradesman at my trade for four years. So I, I had been in the industry for uh, eight years, and uh, I decided at that time that it was a, a change of career was required if I was going to feel fulfilled in my life. So there's kind of almost parallels to George Williams and kind of his kind of whole feeling about the industrial way of doing things wasn't the right way. Well, I'm not sure I would want to class myself in the role of being similar <laughs> to, Roy, to George Williams by any stretch. Um, but, uh, but with George, he, he was um, the seventh of eight children, yeah. born, born to tenant farmers. Uh, he was the slightest in the family. The, his, the expectations of him succeeding um, in, in being able to run the farm were very low. And as a result, it was thought that he was best placed to go into the, the drapery trade. Okay. Now, that was a young man who had aspirations for himself, and his aspirations carried him to a height that probably most of us will never reach. You're exactly right. It's quite, quite incredible how much he achieved in his life from such kind of humble beginnings. Well, he was 22 when he held the meeting on the 6th of June with 11 of his friends upstairs in the drapery store. And at that first meeting, they decided they were going to form an organization. And at their second meeting, which was uh, four weeks later, they decided they were going to call that organization the Young Men's Christian Association, which has become what we know today as the YMCA. That is properly incredible to have gone from so small to so big so quickly. Um, you spoke about George Williams had a, a drive that kind of kept him going, kept going. What do you think was the drive that kept you in the YMCA all these years? I think the passion that I developed quite early on, uh, and that was for the effect that we could have on the lives of young people in our communities. And I grew up, to, I grew up in Carrick Fergus. Uh, and at that time we were going through some um, difficult times in our history and uh, we hated each other in terms of two communities and uh, I don't think I fit it into that mould of hating those that I played with in the street. And what was the role of the YMCA during that time, during the Troubles? To be honest, um, the role of the YMCA in Carrick Fergus was one of being very much a Protestant organisation okay. and uh, it would be unusual for Catholics to come into the club yes. and uh, I set out about changing that and we did it. We did change that although it took a few years to do that. I'd say that that's incredible to, um, to have the ability to change that and kind of the foresight really and strength of character. 
Well, it doesn't take much. It's the little things you do. And uh, I can recall, and this may be a bit of a bizarre story, but I can recall uh, the first time a young Catholic lad came into the club and I went over to one of the so-called hard unionist lads and said, that lad's a Catholic, make sure he enjoys himself. And when I come back through the club room later, the two of them were playing table tennis together. It's fantastic. So then the YMCA, here you're touching on kind of diversity and kind of how the YMCA has been trying to bring in much, a lot of um, inclusion really in the last number of years. I, I think the, the, where, where that started off for me was I was involved in a youth club in my local town, my local community with a population of 28,000. Yeah. And I seen, a, I seen a, a poster on the wall in reception one night saying, do you want to go to India? And I thought, do I want to? And I thought, yes, I do. Now, this was back in the 70s. Yeah. And uh, I went on, I joined a work camp that was going from the YMCA um, in England yeah. um, to India to um, work in villages across India. And, I, and I, I was just absolutely blown away by the scale of the organisation that I had got involved in. And I don't think I fully appreciate it, the scale of the organisation that I did get involved in. And once you see it in that context, in terms of being part of a global movement, to not be diverse yeah. is, is something that... You, 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 if, 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 if you're not diverse, then you've got a problem. Uh, the organisation has got a problem and thankfully I think progressively we have moved and are moving into the areas with, where we should be addressing in terms of inclusion of all people. Yeah, brilliant. And so is that the first moment you're kind of travelling to India and seeing all this that you realised that there was more to the YMC than just Carrick Fergus, just your small hometown? Absolutely, absolutely. And I, and I think one of, the, one of the first things it taught me was humility. And, and that was about standing alongside villagers in a, pro, in a YMCA project, yeah. uh, clearing earth in order to put a culvert so that uh, traders could get out of their village to go to market when the rains came. Yeah. And I was a young whippersnapper, and I thought, why don't we get a digger in to do this? Yeah. And the answer came back was, at that time, you know, the skills didn't exist to maintain a digger within the village and it was much more beneficial to the community development, yeah. which I would see as clear as day now, uh, in terms of the village pulling together and working together and to, to improve their own um, circumstances. Yeah, so the YMCA really has a different role wherever it goes to. That's quite a fascinating idea that the you know, an organisation can kind of mould to what it's needed. We would say that, uh, that the YMCA goes in a place where it's needed and it will go when it's invited. Now, there are some places where, where YMCA's are proactively planted or engaged or created or service deliveries put in place that enable it to spread its wings. But generally speaking, we would be seeking to serve the needs of that community, whatever they may be. So in one place, it may be about employment, whereas in, in another place, it may be the nutritional value of crops that, that are grown within a village. Or, or the the standard of milk that's coming from goats in a, in a village, and so it depends on 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 what's happening where in that context. That's quite incredible, really. To talk about the past of the YMCA and its culture, what do you think is the the main culture and heritage of the YMCA? Well, it, right from the very outset, it was agreed that that, that, that the, the, those twelve men agreed that it would not be a denominational uh, organisation it would be quite definitely be a Christian organisation, but non-denominational, and they would not associate themselves with any particular church. So that was the first thing that, that placed it in, in what was probably the very first ecumenical organisation in the world. Yeah, that, was, that was incredibly far-seeing that they decided to do yeah. that. Yeah, I, I would agree that that was far-seeing. Far um, and and, and the, the, the reason that they got together in order to do something was to improve the lot of the young men who were working in similar situations as themselves in the community where they were living and working. And I think that's what continues today in terms of operating and serving in communities uh, where there is need for 
additional support yeah. in whatever way that might come. What do you think are the key moments in the history of the YMCA? Key moments would be quite definitely the great exhibition that was run by Prince Albert, who was the husband of Queen Victoria at the time, in 1851. And that was about bringing together all the achievements of the uh, the, the mechanised, I guess the first industrial revol revolution, yeah. um, and bringing together those things from across the British Empire as it was then. And I, I think that, well, I, well, I know that in fact that um, those people who were involved in the YMCA handed out leaflets at the Great Exhibition, and I think they handed out a quarter of a million leaflets to people that were travelling from across the world to go and, uh, and, and they went back. And uh, by December of that year, the first YMCA had been set up in North America uh, and, uh, and very quickly followed by another. I think the other, the second one was in Canada, and I apologise to both the Canadians and, the, and, and the, 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 uh, the folks from the USA if I've got that the way, wrong way around, because I may just have done. So if it wasn't for this kind of festival, really, that it might, the YMCA might have taken so much longer to expand it? There, there was there was reports in the Boston Globe, for example, um, in the late uh, 1840s about this organisation that was taking shape. So okay. it may be that it would still have gone on, yeah. um, but that's what happened. And then, of course, the next stage was uh, that the first, first World Conference was held um, four years later in Paris. And uh, that's when the founding document of the, um, the organisation was, was put in place and that's known today as the Paris Basis. So I'd say that was probably the biggest initial uh, event that contributed to YMCA uh, being what it is today. The next one probably would have been the Jubilee in, in uh, 19, sorry, 1894 and astonishingly there was 1900 delegates attended from around the world and, uh, and that was a, a very significant event. And uh, in that year, Queen Victoria knighted George Williams. So he became Sir George Williams. Now, if you think in that period, now you've got to consider the context. There was no railways, no passenger railways in 1844. Um, there was the, the freight railways, but no passenger railways. There was certainly no airplanes. There was no fast ships across oceans. So people obviously travelled long, t uh, you know, took a long time to travel to London to go to um, the, the Jubilee in 18, uh, uh, 1894. The next one after that was probably... Sorry, could I ask just about that? Yeah. What is it about the YMCA that took these 19,000 people willing to kind of go through... Like, we, we give out about a 17-hour plane, plane journey, not a, a five-day boat from India yeah. to get to there. What do you think it is part of the YMCA that drives people I think, to I, I think a belief in a shared vision and a, and a shared mission. And, and that was that, uh, that people of all faiths and none would be welcomed. Um, but it was quite, in a context which was quite definitely Christian. And the emphasis was improving um, the life chances of the individuals uh, that were involved in the YMCA at that time. Fantastic. And then the next key moment after that, where would you think it went then? Well, that's, a, that's a, 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 another good question. In, although YMCA started in, uh, in 1844, by 1862, when the American Civil War took place, 5,000 volunteers provided care services to people that were fighting on both sides. So they had set a pattern down for serving in times of great need yeah. with people who were in need. And that then was picked up uh, when the First World War broke out and the services started to be provided to those who were um, suffering as a result of the conflict during World War I. And the things that happened at that time were quite incredible. And there was the, the, the backbone of the service was being delivered by women. So uh, you, we, we hear sometimes today that, uh, that women did not get involved in the YMCA until uh, the 60s or late 50s, early 60s. Well, that's not true. They, admittedly, yes, they were involved in service roles, but within those service roles, there was, there was women who were in the leadership 
of those particular organisations that were provided the services. So I would say the, the service in war was a, another significant event that placed the YMCA uh, in, in, in the mind of the public and strongly in the mind of the public. I have read that in World War One and World War Two, when the YMCA was involved, they helped people from both sides of the conflict. And I was just wanting to ask, the YMCA began in England. At what point was it that it became a global organisation of we look after everyone? Was there ever a point where it was like, was that the first kind of foundation of the YMCA was we will look globally, we'll not look nationally, if you know what I'm trying to say? That took place in, in uh, 18... Uh, sorry, uh, that took place in... Uh, 1855 when the Paris Basis was signed gotcha. because that's when people travel from different countries to be part of that. Yeah. Fantastic, wonderful. Have you been part of any of the key events within the YMCA yourself? I think the, the first one that I was part of was um, 1994 okay. um, when we celebrated the 105th anniversary and we celebrated that in London and we celebrated that with a, um, a World Council taking place in London and, uh, and a service in Westminster Abbey in the presence of um, Queen Elizabeth II. That's an incredibly impressive um, thing to have. Well, yeah, uh, I, I, and that was, that was in terms of celebration terms. I think one of the other things was when we took the Paris bases and we started to uh, look at it and how it affected um, today's society and uh, it was in 1998 that I attended a World Council where uh, what, what is now called Challenge 21 was put in place which began to reinterpret the Paris bases into a language that met the needs of uh, rights of women and children, uh, protecting the environment, um, working for wholeness and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that was in, uh, as I say, in, in 1998. So that would probably would be one of the biggest um, changes that I would have participated in. So you've had a long career in the YMCA kind of partnership. How long have you been part of the organisation? Well, I have worked full time for the organisation for f coming up on 40 years. And of course... You don't look at David. Yes, you'll be kept. <laughs> um, and, and then there was times as a volunteer uh, and as a, a youth club member before that. So all told, probably about around, I guess, 45, 46 years, something yeah. like that. So as we're sitting here in front of um, George Williams' desk and a portrait mm. behind him, we have lots of artefacts from the history of the YMCA. What do we have here at this exhibition here at the YMCA 175? Well, well per perhaps to put uh, in the uh, first place to put it in the context, um, we knew that this was coming up as our 170th anniversary. Um, so that in 2019, we would celebrate that. And last year we had a, a, a World Council in Chiang Mai and in Thailand. And uh, I had been asked if I would consider taking the lead on working with others to develop uh, a heritage input to the, the 175 celebrations. So I sat in a little coffee shop with I think eight or ten other people from different parts of the world and we talked about the possibility of creating something where we could begin to communicate our heritage and history to those that were coming to London for the 175th anniversary. And uh, what we have here is um, a number of ways of telling untold stories and telling afresh the stories that we already know. So we set about doing that in a way that could be interactive, um, that could be uh, reflective, and that could be informative. And we brought together those stories in different formats, some that relate to artifacts, uh, some that relate to current day contemporary images, and some that relate it to pieces of art that have been contributed to uh, during the, the history of YMCA. And during your looking, during your search for these artefacts, did you find any stories that you found that you didn't know yourself? Do you find incredible? I think there's a couple of things that I found incredible. One of those things was to find um, paintings that were painted by prisoners of war during the Second World War in an art competition um, for prisoner of war held in Switzerland. So and there was prisoner of war art competitions. That's right. Uh, there, and, and we have got six, uh, we have got uh, copies of six of those on display in the art section of the exhibition here. That's absolutely amazing. I never realised something like that even happened during wartime. 
I think the, the, the thing is that we have always offered impartial service and the stories are told about um, prisoners of war being treated in a way that was treating them as, uh, with dignity and respect. And there was quite a number of people after the war that returned to their homelands and decided that they were going to set up YMCA's of their own. And, uh, and I told that story one day at, a, at an international event and there were, those were German soldiers that were going back to Germany. And there was a, a woman from Germany who was sat around the table when I was telling the story. And she says, and yes, and they continued to meet in reunion until 1990. And one of them was still involved in her YMCA. So that story was, was real. The other thing that came out of that was uh, a chap called, and we have a story about Egon Slopianka, which, which was, um, an Austrian man who was also held as a prisoner of war. And when he was uh, released, because of the treatment that he had got from YMCA volunteers while incarcerated, he decided he was going to give a year of his life to God. And he ended up giving the rest of his life to the YMCA. And he was the person who created the, the um, European Alliance of YMCA, which then stepped alongside those from the emerging Soviet bloc who were wanting to rejoin and re-engage with the global movement and he, he initially handled um, the, start, the, start, the start of the building of those, of those relationships and then others took that on and carried that forward. It does show the incredible ethos of the YMCA, um, these stories. I think it does. I, I think you, you can go to many places, you know, you, and, and the thing that fascinates me is where, where we do what we do. We talked earlier about um, serving the needs in communities. There are YMCA staff and volunteers who are meeting the boats that are coming into Greece. Um, and on the, on the dock side, they're going and they're playing games with the even now the YMCA is still um, still doing this humanitarian role that in day and age really shouldn't be needed. I, I, well, I think, I, I, I think it is needed. You know, and oh, I, and, I, I, and I, I understand what you're saying. I'm trying to say in yeah. a world, in this modern world, we shouldn't still need to have the fact that this happens. I believe you're right. I believe you're absolutely right. And I would go on to say, and I would get quite emotional as I'm sure you gather yes. you know, when I talk about those things. Um, but it's, it's the same in other places, so in places of other conflict. So you could take um, you know, Palestine, for example, where volunteers are, are playing with children and creating memories, great memories um, of, of things that create resilience. And they're doing that among the rubble of burnt out places. And they're doing it in other places as well. We are, that's, where we're, that's where we are. So it really shows the depth of service that the YMCA provides whereas in some places it's a, it's a, um, a place to bring children you know, to play soccer with or something on a Saturday, in other places it's to help children in a war torn area it's quite incredible the depth that YMCA does I think, I think that's right and I think we learnt that through the service in war through the service through conflict that it's important to, to give dignity to people and, and, and improve people's lot and, uh, and hopefully set them up for a um, a, a, a future where we would use the term belong, contribute and thrive. So belonging to a community, contributing to, to the community and thriving within the community. And I, I, that would be our goal, certainly from a YMCA England and Wales perspective. I think you saying about community, I think that's one of the most important things there is in the world really. If you don't feel accepted in a place, you're never going to thrive in it. I think that's absolutely right. And it's got to be a safe space and a safe place where you can feel that you can, you can develop that community, you can grow into that community. And, uh, and that, that would be the mission that we're on, is to create those spaces where people can feel safe and can explore common humanity and, and explore their own personal growth and development. So this exhibition is coming to um, Carrick Fergus in a number of days. I'd just like you to um, talk about what's the history of the YMCA in Ireland? OK, well, the, the YMCA in Ireland started very early on. And of course, at that time in the 1800s, YMCA, uh, the YMCA, YMCA Ireland actually was um, one country. 
Um, and the YMCA started, I think, was one of the first countries where YMCA started to grow um, in, in Ireland and, uh, and, has, and has gone from strength to strength. And I think one of the good things about um, YMCA in Ireland has been that even through its troubled times, you know, there has been one movement and, 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 and it has grown into something that is significant, I believe, in changing attitudes and changing um, views towards those who may come, come from a different uh, Christian or, or cultural background. How do you think the role of the YMCA has changed since um, its beginning? I think it has progressed and changed to suit the time that it's in and, uh, and to suit the... I think there has been a more professionalisation of it. Um, I think in some cases we have perhaps not um, sufficiently let our history and heritage inform us for today. Okay. And uh, I so think... it's kind of, if you don't look at the past, you're doomed to repeat it. That's that's possible. That's possible for sure. Um, uh, but I think it is it is something that we need to um, be mindful of and looking to see what lessons we have learnt and and see how they can be continued. Um, uh, see how they can continue to inform us for the services we deliver today. And I, and the uh, the fascinating thing about this exhibition is that the number of young people who have engaged in it and have, uh, have participated in, in uh, the interactive sections of it. And I hope that when we do go to um, Carrick Fergus, that, uh, and I, I'm convinced actually when we go to Carrick Fergus, that a similar thing will happen and, and that there will be a passion ignited in, in people's being that actually uh, wants them to learn more and to get more involved in YMCA because of who we are and what we believe. It's when you give people the opportunity to see the past, I think people are really willing to kind of engage in it and kind of move forward with it. I think that's absolutely right, and that has been my experience. Once you, once you, in, once you uh, shine a light on the reason that we are, then people rise to it. And I, my experience has been that it is young people that seem to catch the the vision today for where we need to go and how we might affect the society and community where we live. Where do you see the YMCA moving in the next 175 years? Well, I honestly am not sure if that's the truth. We right? could all be driving flying cars by that point. It's a we could possibly be. But I guess one of the things that you might be able to do is try and see, try and see it through George Williams' eyes and how he might see it. So, you know, you could ask yourself the question, you know, what would George think of what we're doing today? That was going to be my final question. You've already beat me to it. Was it really? <laughs> yes. Well, let's see, let's see if, we, if we can address it. And uh, let me just see if we've got... If, if, we want, if we want to see things through someone else's eyes, perhaps what we've got to do is we've got to um, maybe take a serious look at that. Yeah. And what I've got here, right, is an actual pair of George Williams glasses, right? And I guess if I put those on, then perhaps it can begin to... Um, See through his eyes? But create the, create the, the sense of... Um, that if, if I could see through George Williams' eyes, what would I see and what would that mean for the future? Fantastic. Ken, thank you very much. Not at all.